Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 21 of the IROC Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger, and I live in the far southwest corner of Minneapolis, Minnesota, with my husband and my giant chocolate labradoodle. Uh, my daughter, Kylie, is home for the summer, but will be going off to law school in the fall. So we are currently um, empty nesters with one back in the nest. Can I just tell you all how difficult that has been? I really want to parent her. She's 22. She doesn't need parenting. <laughs> but she hasn't lived at home since she was 18. So she comes back into our home and I fall back into an old dynamic that I remember from when she lived here before. Does that make sense? So I say, say things like, do you need to take some sunscreen along? And she rolls her eyes. Anyway, we're not fighting or arguing. It's just, she's also in my space and she has uh, things to do. She's busy, I'm busy. We're trying to um, do things together because she's home, but then we're also trying to do things apart, right? So anyway, welcome to everyone. Let's, um, let's check to see who um, kind of got in touch this week. I think I had a huge list. Um, 41 knitters <laughs> sent me comments. So here we go. Andrea Ribera, Amy Mickelson, Irene of the Three Ply Podcast, Sabrina Shelton, Tiffany Scharf, Mary B. Hi, Mary. Um, Beth Hoskins, Joanne Goldenberg, Michelle Gross, Liz Nava, PJ, Knitting with Quills. And PJ had a new pattern out last week, maybe. She designed a men's knitted tie. So if you're looking for a last minute Father's Day gift, you might wanna look at that. It was in the top of the hot right now on Ravelry, which means lots of people were visiting her page. And she's the gal who has the hedgehog rescue and has a hedgehog on her podcast. So you might wanna check that out, Knitting with Quills. Um, Stacy Feichtner, Peggy Svee, Sharon Sienauer, Connie Simonich, Kathy Thomas, Kelly Mathern, Carol Morrison, Beverly Bullock, Beverly got in touch. Where's my note? I have a great note from Beverly. So Beverly sent me a note. She said that she and Emma Butcher often follow one another in the comments on my podcast. So I will read their names and read them back to back. And ironically, they became friends via Ravelry and this is a great story. So Bev and Emma uh, were in a different podcast group where they were chatting and going back and forth and they got to be friends uh, via you know Ravelry messaging and Emma lives in New Zealand <laughs> and Bev lives in Tennessee so they started um, kind of a correspondence and then they decided to exchange gifts and the ironic thing about all of that is that they also both watch my podcast and then have come up in the comments as being commenters back to back so a little you know, serendipitous there. Um, I just think that's neat that someone could meet a friend on Ravelry who is living in another country. Uh, that's just a neat little story, I think. Um, let me see, where'd I leave off? Susan Wright, Angela Jen Jenkins, Lisa Navajo, Angela, say hi to the dogs for me. Um, Pat Howes, Eileen Tamaro, Amy Blanford, Beth Thorson, Marty Mullen, Andy Ferris, Sharon Quinn, Jane Dickison, Helen Henry, Rachel Weisenstein, Stein, Steen, I last, Stein. I think I know the phonic rule. Tell me if I'm wrong. Prudence, Beverly Faith, Peggy, Peggy Bork, Taylor in South Dakota, Edina Cole, Azar Lorospor, Michelle of Knit Takes Two, Kathy Goodman, and Jackie May. So many of you have reached out to me again and again. I just wanna say hi to all of you individually and have a little chat here and talk about the things that you've said to me. But I commented back on YouTube, so I don't need to specifically personally chat with each of you, but I would like to. <laughs> so anyway, welcome to everyone who reached out last time. I, I, if that list gets much longer, I probably shouldn't read it, but I figure if you took the time to reach out to me and we had a little chat. I had a little chat with several, 
I had a long chat with several of you. And so we've got some questions today that I'm gonna go over. Um, I have two patterns for us to look at today. I also um, have a little Corey stories and we'll see um, how fast we can get this done. It's like 1.30 in the afternoon. I started getting ready about 9 a.m. <laughs> Cause you gotta get all the stuff out and I have to set up my camera and set up the lighting which I didn't turn on because I, I felt like the light from the window was pretty bright today. But if this shadowed side starts to bother me, I'll turn, turn the lights on. Um, but anyway, I have a little note from last week. I talked about the Foxy sweater and being a pattern by Natalia Moreva. And several of you got in touch to tell me um, what had happened there. And if you are interested, you can go out to Ravelry and read the story behind why Nat Natalia is not going to be on Ravelry anymore. It, I don't feel like it's my story to share and some things, you know, went down and it, it's not always, uh, you know, it's a, there were some business de decisions made on both sides. And so I'm just not gonna bring up, but I do thank the three people who <laughs> got in touch right away and said, here's what happened. And because I did say I wanted to know. A lot of you commented that you were glad that I made mention of not sharing patterns and copyright. And that felt good to me because it's always hard to make a pronouncement like that. That's a, you know, ethical decision in my book. Um, and not everyone sees it that way. But thanks for reaching out and tell me that you thought that that was a uh, nice thing for me to talk about and to sh not share patterns. We shouldn't share patterns with one another. Um, oh, I have a note here that PJ's pattern that I talked about in the intro is called Kayak the Ambassador Tie. She names each of her patterns or is going to name because she's a new designer, each of her patterns after a, a hedgehog. And so this is Kayak the Ambassador. That's the, the hedgehog. Um, Carolyn DP put a note in the audiobooks uh, section this week that she's read three new books about um, the Amish and an Amish family uh, as neighbors. And she said that they were really good. She started in order, really enjoyed reading all three of those. So if you're interested in reading about um, perhaps the Amish culture, the um, Amish family, uh, you could go out and look at the Ravelry group. And under audiobooks, I give a list of... Um, what the, she gave a list of what the books actually were, the titles of each of the books. This week, I read The Clockmaker's Daughter by Kate Morton. I'll try to show you the, just the thing. So you might recognize it more than, sometimes I recognize a book cover, not the title, if I've read it or not. Um, it was 17 hours long, so it was, a, it was a long one. I enjoyed it. I listened to it mostly at the dog park, a little bit in the car. <laughs> Uh, it has a ghost. There's a ghost narrator. So kind of third person omniscient, if I'm going back to my English <laughs> uh, type of teaching here. Um, so the, you have this person telling the story who is able to see everything that's happening and narrate it from kind of a third person point of view, but then you eventually figure out, oh well, quite soon along that it's a spirit or a ghost that's living in the house and, and telling the story of the people who have come through. And so there, it's one of those um, stories that goes back in time and starts telling that story and then comes back to the present. So they're trying to figure out um, things that have happened to the people in the past. There's a little bit of a mystery. Um, I, yeah, I really liked it. I would give it four out of five stars. Um, I, a lot of times if I'm not gonna give it a four, I, if I'm gonna give something a three or two, I'm not gonna keep listening to it. So anyway, yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Clockmaker's Daughter, Kate Morton. I've read a number of things by her and um, I, she has a ton of research. So you learned about painters, you learned about photography, you learned about landscapes, you learned about um, a castle or a manor in a moat. You um, learned about clocks and clock making. So she has a lot of research and I, I appreciate that in an author that they take the time to really kind of suss out the details. So yeah, that was good. The IROC Knits Designs Cal is still going on. I didn't mention it last time, but it's out there. If you are interested in knitting one of my patterns and you would like to post a picture of it, then you can win a $25 gift certificate in my group. So there's a thread in the group. Just open up a thread, reply to thread, hit the little picture icon, 
You can grab picture, your picture off of Ravelry. If you've never done that before, there's a tutorial on Ravelry for how to put a picture in a thread. Um, but it's not too difficult to do, and I think there's only six, maybe six entries for this these two months, May and June. So you've got some time if you wanted to, to start working on something or or you've already knit something and you've you know never put it in the thread. So then go ahead and put it in the thread and then you can um, go ahead and try to win. $25 gift card to Etsy. Okay. ZK is coming up. The Zombie Knit Apocalypse, which really has absolutely nothing to do with zombies, um, is held in Rochester, Minnesota in June every year. And this, it's sponsored by the Stockinette Zombies. And they claim that you go into a zombie-like trance if you have to knit miles of stockinette. Something like that, right? So Megan and Amy host this retreat. I think this is the seventh year? Gosh, sixth or seventh year. Um, and I've gone every year. I am teaching two classes at the retreat. They get volunteers to teach the classes and then they take the teachers out to dinner um, as kind of payment and we get a little badge gift type of thing. So I am teaching uh, Latvian and horizontal braids in a one hour class and I'm teaching beginning brioche in a one hour class. I've never taught brioche as a class before. I'm not an expert. Um, I can't fix all mistakes in brioche yet, but I've been practicing making mistakes in brioche and trying to fix it. <laughs> But for beginners, I can get you through the first part. So, and the I think the class is, both my classes filled right away. Um, so I probably should have offered it more than once. But anyway, um, maybe I'll see some of you. I know I got a comment this week um, from someone that watches the podcast that they got in off the wait list at the last minute. And I said, make sure you come up and say hello to me because you know what I look like, but I don't necessarily know what all of you look like. So... Um, okay, Kathy Goodman, I'm going to remember to do this this week. Kathy Goodman is a frequent commenter on my podcast, and we've become pen pals, friends. Uh, we go back and forth. But Kathy doesn't have a knitting group. And I love my knitting groups so much that I said to her in a comment, I'm going to find you some knitters. <laughs> so this is my plea. If you live around, near, or by Ocean City, Maryland the eastern side of Maryland, um, you know, out in the, kind I guess you can call it the DC area if you're geographically just pointing across the nation. Kathy is looking for some people to knit with. So I don't have a ton of followers on the podcast. I mean, you know, a few thousand, but not thousands and thousands. So what are the chances? But maybe like Beverly and Emma, Kathy can find somebody to knit with in her in her area. So if you uh, if you do live in that area, go ahead and give Kathy a little PM on Ravelry, will you, for me? Because I'm going to find her a knitting group. Or if you're interested and you don't know of any knitting groups in that area, we did look on Ravelry, and there were some groups that meet. So you can search the groups on Ravelry for things like that, like does anybody meet in my area? Is there a meetup? Is somebody doing Knit in Public Day? Those kinds of things you can search in the groups and see if anybody's got an event already set up or if there's a group or a meeting. So um, that's just a, a trick that you can try if you're also looking for information about people in your area. And we found several, but no one actually right in her vicinity. So I thought I would just give it a little shout out here. Okay, this morning my friend Carla, who is a cat woman, but I'm a dog woman, sent me the cutest email and it made me smile and I sat in there and watched this little video. So I'm sure I'm gonna share it with all you. I'll put the link in the show notes. This is the subject title. High school cross country team takes lonely shelter dogs on their morning runs. Isn't that awesome? I can't imagine the paperwork that had to go into that thing happening, but I'll show you guys the picture. Look at all those guys and there were, there were a couple girls in there. And they're running the shelter dogs and the shelter dogs look so happy. It's a one minute video. And the coach said, I'm not sure who was more excited and having the most fun, the dogs or the kids. Either way, it was a great time and I'm sure we will do it again sometime soon. So normally I wouldn't necessarily share that with you, but this is something that I think should be passed on, right? Because if one school in one county in California can do it, other schools can do it all over the United States. And we can make connections with animals and kids 
and and help everybody out, right? Because the an animal human connection is a special connection that a lot of people never have the opportunity to receive as a gift, right? So I thought, oh, I'm gonna share it because maybe there's someone out here watching whose son or daughter runs cross country or they know the cross country coach or they're, they know the high school or, or they just go for a run. Maybe you're just a runner and maybe you love dogs and, but you can't have one because someone in your house is allergic or whatever. Like, I don't know, but let's, let's just take, a, take that on for the podcast, okay? One more thing to add. <laughs> to, the, to the podcast. Okay, uh, another question that I had this week came from someone in the um, Ravelry threads. And she asked me about um, last week when I was talking about yarn weights and the thick and thinness of yarn and how uh, you can look at the label to figure out how thick or thin the yarn is. And that that's my best measure is to look at the label, look at the yardage, look at the weight and compare it to other yardage and weights. And I gave you a link to, to a place where you could find out that information. Well, she uses standard reps per inch. And she asked me if, if you know, if there was anything wrong with that or should she be um, using another measure? And here's my whole tip and trick on this. I think some of you might be starting to think that I have all or most of the answers in the knitting world, I don't. <laughs> I think I've been clear about that, but if, it, if something works for you, then you're not wrong. You should be doing it or using it. I, I never would presume to say that my way or the highway, right? If wraps per inch works for someone, I have a wraps per inch tool which is a little uh, tool with a notch cut out of the bottom and then you wrap the yarn in between the notch and then you count how many wraps you get in there. So let's say I wrap it round, around, 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 around and I get 24 wraps in that little two inch. Then I could take this standard form of wraps per inch and tell me how thick my yarn is. And here, this is from the Craft Yarn Council, how to measure wraps per inch. It's a whole tutorial on how to do it. You just, you can wrap it around a ruler. A ruler works fine, but spinners will use a tool to measure how thick the yarn they've spun is so that when they get done, they know what they've spun. Then they use wraps per inch more off, most often. They wrap it around and then measure it. And then they go by this little, this little chart. So I printed it out to remind everybody because maybe not, maybe the way I explained it last week doesn't work for you. I mean, maybe you didn't get it. Maybe you didn't understand my comparing weights and yardages. And if you didn't, and this makes more sense, you're like, oh, I could wrap it around something and count how many, you know, wraps per inch I get, and then look to see how, you, that's especially effective if you don't have a label, right? Remember how I told you you could, um, fold something in half and stick it through your needle gauge hole. And that gives you a rough idea of where to start for gauge with. Uh, but if you wanna save time, wraps for inch works great. I just think it's a little difficult to be really accurate. And maybe it's just because I haven't done it enough. If I would practice it more, I would get more accurate at it. Because I think it's easy to wrap my wraps too close together, like really kind of pile them up side by side by side and not get quite as accurate of a reading as if I would just kind of lay them in side by side. But they have pictures on this Craft uh, Yarn Council. There's lots of good information on the Craft Yarn Council. If you've never gone out to that website and look at it, I'll link it in the show notes. But that was, was a really good question. And if that works for you, maybe I should just send you my unlabeled yarn and you could tell me what the reps per inch number is because I'm not always really good at that. And maybe I just have, have not practiced. That's what I told her. I said, maybe if I did it more often, I, it would become really commonplace and I would just get it. Okay, so um, Carol asked a question in the Ravelry group um, about knitting for a pear shape. She's talking about trying to adjust a pattern because her bottom is larger than her top is what I'm saying. So a lot of times uh, people have to adjust a pattern because their bust is proportionally bigger than their shoulders or their shoulders are proportionally bigger than their waist. So they might do waist shaping in 
she's talking about doing waist shaping and going out for the widest part of her circumference. And I think that is super common um, adjustment that people make. And so this is the, the reply that I wrote her. I'm gonna try to be more succinct in my rambling answer this week. Hi, Carol. Yes, you would definitely want to cast on more stitches at the bottom of the sweater and then decrease your way into the waist or upper waist, just below your bust. Do you have a top that you like the fit of? That's where I'd start. Lay it out flat and measure it. The width at the bottom says, say 30 inches across, would be your starting number for the front or the back. Take this number times the gauge you are getting. Let's say you're getting five stitches to the inch. 30 times five each equals 150. That's the number of stitches you cast on for the piece. If knitting in the round, then cast on 300, because you gotta do the front and the back. Compare the, this number to the waist number on the pattern you're using, so whatever number they have for the circumference of the waist, and do the subtraction, say 300 minus 200. You've got to reduce your stitch count by 100 stitches. If you're doing four per round, one in the front and one in the back, on each of the two side seams, you'll need to do 25 rounds of decreases. Four times 25 is 100. Then I usually like to do my decreases every four or five rounds. I don't like to do them too close together. So they're not so close to, oh, I just said that. See, I'm already embellishing. But sometimes you have to do them closer depending on how many inches you have to work toward in height. Let's say you've got 10 inches from the bottom of your, of your hind end to your waist. You need to evenly distribute those stitches and the decreases over that 10 inches of height. So you make your decreases happen. Boy, I crammed a lot of info in there. I hope this makes sense. And she says, let me know if you'd like me to explain it in the podcast. And she got back to me and said, I get it. I totally get what you said. She probably had to read it a couple of times, but she was happy to have me explain it on the podcast. So I hope that that's helpful for people. That response is out in the Ravelry threads. Um, in questions for Corey. And so you can just go take a look at it if you'd like to look at those numbers and maybe print it out for yourself. You just have to figure out how big around your bottom needs to be or how big around your bust needs to be and then either decrease or increase depending on what numbers you get and what gauge you are. It's all math. The whole thing is math. Um, Elizabeth Zimmerman taught us well, take your number of stitches per inch times the circumference of what it, or, or the flat, you could just do it in the flat and only cast on half the stitches. So that was a, a really good question because I do think a lot of people struggle with altering patterns and um, patterns aren't all written in our sizes, right? If, if Especially if you're hard to buy for off the rack, you know, th that average standard, those things fit you, which they rarely do, I think. I don't know how, how tall people do it because I'm short and stuff is never super, super long on me. So if you're tall, I think you probably have, you know, the worst four links. Okay, Helen asked me, just wondering when I buy a pattern, how I can tell if I'm getting a good one. By that, I mean written correctly. I have read many times in Cal's postings where beginner knitters have the same problem, stitch counts off, etc. They tink pack and redo it numerous times, and then they find out it's the pattern and not them. Very frustrating to say the least. Anyway, is there a way to know you are getting a correctly written pattern? I have a few thoughts on that. A, a large paragraph worth. I told you I had a lot of conversations with people this week. We went back and forth a few times. Hi, Helen. What I'm seeing now is the new trend is that on Ravelry pattern page, designers are letting you know if a pattern has been test knit and or tech edited. See the bottom of the paragraph on my pattern pages. I say, test knitters were, tech editor was. That means that at least several sets of eyes have really taken time with the pattern. That being said, no one is perfect and we all have the best intentions for perfectly written patterns and something can slip through. Most good designers will always update an arrow as fast an error as fast as they can, but there are some folks out there who might not want to put the energy in, so they just say, nah, I'm leaving it. It's always a good idea to check project pages. Knitters will leave comments about poorly written patterns or also patterns that are well-written. However, 
just as important, I think, as finding patterns that are written the way you like to knit. For example, I use words, lots of words. My knitting book partner, Megan, uses charts and graphs. You can glance at a pa our patterns and know immediately who wrote which one. That's why the tagging system on Ravelry that gives you information in little green boxes halfway down the page of a pattern page can give you some real tips. Is it charted? Is it written? Is it top down, bottom up, schematic? Then when you know what you like, it's a bit easier to narrow it down. Also, if you like a designer, then knit lots of things by them because that means you like their style. All of my patterns are now checklist patterns. Some knitters really love this. They can check off each row as they go and never lose their place. However, that means that my patterns are quite long to print because the check boxes take up more space than in the typical pattern. So that might be really frustrating for some knitters who don't find that helpful. Always, always check the pattern page before starting for errata. It will always be posted in, if an update has been made, and if you purchase the pattern via Ravelry, you will get an update in your library. But that means you will also have to print out the latest issue. I have had a typo in one of my patterns that I updated, and I will often get questions sent to me questioning in it, and I often have to ask, do you have the updated version of the pattern? And that, you know, that has happened a couple of times where people just haven't gone to their Ravelry library and printed out the most recent update. And that would be in your Ravelry in a little box under the picture of the pattern and the name of the pattern. There will be a little gray box that says update. And you have to click on that in order for it to update your PDF that you've previously purchased. It does it automatically. You just have to click on it, but then you have to print out the most recent copy. I do believe that there are some poorly written patterns out on Ravelry. I do think it's a real shame if a podcaster, a knitter, uh, indie dyer is having a knit along with a poorly written pattern because you're making a real choice there to include a whole bunch of people in a knit along if you haven't done your due diligence to check that there are no errors in that pattern before you all start. You know, I mean, you, you just have to be really cautious. I do think that a lot of people don't know. You know that when you're looking at a pattern page on Ravelry, there are some clues to which patterns you want to read the descriptions of on people's project pages. I don't know if I'm saying that very well, but here I'm gonna show you an example. On someone's project page on Ravelry, in the upper right-hand corner of the, index card kind of they're they're in you know little card forms in the upper right hand corner there can be little emoji symbols and the first one that usually appears if someone has written a good tip hint question problem solution is a little life buoy so it's a white life buoy right there and one person said that that pattern page had a good comment and it helped them. So I'm gonna click on this one. It's the owl sweater, 9,000 people have made it. And this person wrote a fairly lengthy, lengthy post about their project and what they did. And at the bottom of that, it says that has been viewed 49 times. 49 people have clicked on this project pattern page. And at the next to that, it says it helped one person. And in tiny little print, it says, are these notes helpful? Way down here at the bottom right here. And you can click yes, if what you read that that person wrote was helpful to you. And that gives the little life buoy, the little lifesaver, the little white ring with the four red little lines on it, another click so that two people have found it helpful or three people have found it helpful. So you don't have to read through 9,705 pattern pages to find out whether or not that pattern had an errata or a mistake or something that wasn't clear. You can just scroll through those project pages to the ones that have the little lifesaver up in the corner. And if you're seeing a ton of lifesavers on pages, then you wanna read all of them because something's going on. People have, people have made it change they figured something out they don't like the fit of something and if it's consistently um, being changed by people then you'll know going into the pattern 
So that's another really good um, search feature on Ravelry. You just click on the top on the patterns, you know, however many there are. And the more patterns, the more likelihood that you'll find lifesavers. Another reason to put your pattern, finish projects, your pattern page, your project page out on Ravelry, right? Because you might have a comment about something like, I made this one inch longer. That might help someone. I think the neck is too wide on that sweater. That might help someone. Another question. Patty says, when you make a sweater out of cotton yarn, how do you weave in your ends? I'm making my first sweater using cotton yarn and don't know my, want my ends to come loose. One site I googled had you weave in the ends and then split the yarn, tie half knot, weave in the ends and keep repeating until you are down to one strand. My yarn is eight ply, so this method could take a while. Very Pink Yard said to tie knot and then snip the ends. This doesn't sound very secure to me. Any recommendation would be appreciated. Okay, this is what I wrote back. Hi, Patty, I weave in my ends just as I do on my wool ones. I follow the outline of the stitches. Say on the back side, I would just follow the pearl bumps up and down and down and up and around and down. Then I would jog up or down a half stitch and do the same thing, up and down, up and down. However, my best bet is to use the side seam or edge seam if there is one. I run the yarn up for about two inches and then turn and come straight back down for about two inches. I usually leave a bit of an end and sometimes fray it out a bit like a fan so it's not as likely to pull out of that last stitch. I've never had any trouble. I've had a teacher tell me to split the yarn in half, use a smaller eye, eye needle and weave in opposite directions. Also splitting the stitches that I'm weaving through, like the pearl bumps in the back, splitting those, that works well too, I think. I never tie knots. I, my mentor from long ago always says, there are no knots in knitting. I don't think that anymore, but I still hear her in my head. <laughs> so I hope that helps. Uh, I just, um, there are lots of ways to finish your knitting to be an excellent finisher. I wouldn't say that I'm a professional knitwear finisher. I have lots of experience, so I've gotten better at it, but I never, I've, I don't even know if I've ever even taken a finishing class. Other than my, my mentor, Rosemary Cosell, um, is in my head. <laughs> she taught me things. I took lots of classes from her. I've told you guys all that story. Um, I did find a new little picture on Instagram of how to weave in your ends on brioche. And I haven't done a lot of that, so I thought this was interesting. Weave in, I'm gonna turn it around so I can read the, the note. Weave in underneath the yarn overs like this. Go under at least five, it will disappear forever. See how the, the line here is the knit stitches and then the pearls are under there? Right up along there. So um, I will try to link to Knit Graffiti's post if it's still out there. Or I'll try to find a picture of someone um, weaving this in, if I can. But I suppose you could pause this video if you wanted to see exactly where she's weaving that. So I printed it out because I have, you know, I have papers and file folders <laughs> everywhere <laughs> of things that I want to remember because my brain probably won't remember. Okay. Let's do the sweater and the shawls of the week this week. Let's go back in time a little bit. We'll start over here. I've got three shawls to show you today. I, I have three iterations of the same shawl, I should say, because it's not three different shawls. But the shawl of the week this time is the Clapatee. And it is a pattern that came out on knitty.com by Kate Gilbert. Gilbert. Yeah, I'll just hold this up like I usually do. There's how you spell it. Clap, pot, tis. Clap a T is how you pronounce it. And this is the description of it on Ravelry. French women are known for wearing scarves. Starting in September and until summer arrives, this is the most important accessory. The scarf may be striped or patterned, colorful, wrinkled, and is much bigger than the scarves you probably have. Women just wrap the scarf around their neck in an a careless effort sort of way and off they go. Since I have lived in Paris, I've realized that these ladies are onto something. I am much warmer wearing a scarf, even if I'm not wearing a jacket or here's my knit version. So 
Here is my knit version of the French scarf. It's knit on the bias, so the variegated yarn makes diagonal stripes and stitches are carefully dropped to make a pattern in the opposite direction. This creates a scarf which tends to be a little more of a parallelogram than a rectangle, but I promise it's nice that way. It's made of the softest, most luxurious yarn I've ever used and is a dream to wear. Instructions are included at the end to modify it to create a stole. Okay, so Kate Gilbert is a well-known knitwear designer. Um, she most recently has been working for Twist Collective, which I just heard is no longer going to be publishing patterns and they gave up their book part of their, their business a while back. I, I wish those ladies could have made a go of it because I don't think there was a man involved in that, so I should, shouldn't say that it was a, a couple of women, a group of women who put that all together and were trying to kind of demand um, better prices on patterns and had like a, all of the archives of Twist Collective, a knitting magazine, online knitting magazine are still out there. So I'm sure you could go and look through all the patterns and that kind of thing. I don't think that they'll probably take the past things down, but Kate was a member of that team. She wrote this pattern in 2004 and it was probably one of the first Ravelry patterns that kind of blew up and went viral, right? If you use that terminology, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people knit this pattern. And it's really fun. That's why I've knit it three times. I don't often knit, <laughs> knit things over and over and over again. But um, 23,400 people knit it. That, that's a lot of patterns. Partly because it's a free pattern. If, if you get a pattern off knitty.com, they're free. So that's one of the reasons that it was probably so well received is that people could easily get it you know, for, for, not, for not any money. It calls for Aran weight yarn, but it you can knit it in any weight. And it's 19 stitches and 25 rows to four inches. So for Aran weight, it, you know, it's just under worsted, you know, just a tad bigger than a 20 stitch gauge on four inches for a worsted weight. And takes about 820 yards of yarn. So there is, there would be lots of information out there about people who made it longer or shorter, but you could kind of say it would take about four skeins of worsted weight. So first of all, I'm gonna show you the construction and how this is made. You start at one corner and you cast on just a few stitches and you're working back and forth this way. And that's what she means by knitting on the bias because you are increasing on the edge of the pattern to make it grow and grow and grow until you get out to a certain point which is right over here. So until you get that much knit from there to there, that would be your, your short end, which is on a diagonal, you are knitting mostly in stockinette, and then you have a, you're knitting through the back loop, purling a stitch and knitting through the back loop, if I kind of remember, don't trust me on that, but I think that's how it went. Then once you get to a certain width, you start knitting just straight and you're not increasing into that, that triangle piece anymore. And you get to drop these stitches. Now, I don't know how anybody ever thought to themselves by looking down at their nylons at church and seeing a run in their leg all the way down to their toe. That would be a great idea for knitting. But every time I see drop stitches, that's what I think of back in the day, right? Used to wear nylons. We always used to wear hose uh, under, especially when I was teaching under our dresses. And you look down and you look like a hot mess because you had this big run up the side of your nylon or your pantyhose or whatever. And that is exactly what this looks like, right? So I don't know why anyone would have thought that that would be a good um, characteristic <laughs> to put in right to something because that's like an error a mistake but anyway so you physically drop these stitches down off as you're working off the it in the instructions are really easy it's not difficult to do i will say that three of my 
two of my three had mohair in them and it's a lot harder to drop those stitches. When you've got mohair, you kind of had to pull them apart and stretch it out and pull them apart and stretch it out all the way down to get them to drop. It runs a lot faster. The run will happen a lot quicker if you have just like a merino yarn. But I knit this one first because that's what Kate's looked like. So here's Kate sitting in a French coffee shop with it all wrapped up around her neck, you know, looking very chic and put together. So I wanted one that looked like hers, kind of pink and purple and variegated yarn. And then you can see the drop stitches here that are running like this across. And it, oopsie, <laughs> don't tip it over. So now I'm gonna show you how long you can make this. So here's, here's mine. So there's one yard, if you say that from the tip of my finger to my nose is a yard roughly of you know three feet of someone if you take a yardstick you can figure out where it is on your body so that'd be one that'd be two and that'd be three so three yards roughly or nine feet long it is and you're just knitting that same repeat over and over and over again to make this happen now i don't think it's beautiful up close like that i don't think that that's super pretty but when you wear it, it is a miraculous piece. So let me see if I can do this. I am going to the theater with my black one because it's fancy. I'm fancy like that. And I can take it and scrunch it up really small. See how it really gets down like that? And I can put it on like this around my neck, kind of like Kate was wearing it open these two pieces up and put my winter coat on, right? Then when I get to the theater, am I bumping this? Hope it, hopefully not. When I get to the theater, I can unwrap this and I can just take the rectangle and throw it down over my sleeveless, short sleeve, whatever dress. Brilliant, right? Because it's hard to wear in Minnesota in the winter, anywhere in the winter. It's hard to wear a big coat and a shawl at the same time. But this provides you that opportunity because it has some mohair in it for warmth. It has a really nice drape. It's very, very soft. And I can wear it up around my neck and then I can open it up and just drape it over my shoulders like this. So you can find this one out on my project page to see what, um, what black yarn I use because I didn't look it up and I could have, but it's, you know, I knit them probably each in the years, probably, I don't know, 2005, six, seven, and eight, something like that. Then uh, some knitters in my knitting group found a yarn at a, at a farm on, online that came on cones, giant cones, and it had been um, raised and spun and we just thought it was beautiful. So this is the second one I made, or yeah, second one I made. And it's this kind of variegated tweedy yarn, which doesn't seem like a Cory color at all anymore, which it really isn't because this is much more me. But it's a nice neutral and I shared the purchase of the yarn. So I think we bought maybe two giant cones of this and it's like a alpaca mohair, I don't know if it was merino or not. And, we, and then we wound it off for the three of us to make this together. So we, you know, we shared the giant purchase of the, the cone because one cone was too much for you know, one person and we, it was just easier for us to, to, to share it. So that's what we did. And so I have this one and starts the same way, you know, triangle in the corner, working your way out to a long, there we go. Rectangle. Everything's done on the bias. To the other end. So I can wear that one the same way. Now, because I knit the brown one, um, I don't think I wore it a whole lot. And then I knit the black one. I had three. <laughs> and you don't need three clapetis. Uh, although they kind of work for different situations. What I did with this one is I turned it into a poncho. 
So I took, I have a long rectangle with diagonal ends, right? Because you make a, a triangle on the ends of them. So we've got this long. So I brought one end around and just sewed it to the side of the other so that you get a neck hole. I'm going to try to show you this. So you get this neck hole here. And then if I turn her around, you get kind of a, a drape in the back and it hangs down longer on one side than it does on the other. So it's very angled on the one side and I just have a, a seam over here where I just whip stitched with the same yarn to make it go across. And you can do that with any, um, any long rectangle piece that you have, that you've knit. I have several rectangle pieces that I turned into kind of an over poncho. Um, let me see if I can show you how you would do it. This is not probably gonna work because it's not long enough, but you've got this rectangle and you just take this end and you bring it over here and sew it to that side. And then, see you've got the hole there for your neck and then it hangs over your head like that off to the side, longer on one end. So, it's not too too difficult. I keep fussing with my top, so I may as well talk about it because this is my Rosa Stritches came to, to see me. He says, Mom, you've been talking for too long. <laughs> Maybe we should go outside in the backyard and throw the bee. Hmm? Okay, let me finish up with this sweater and then we'll, we'll maybe do that, okay, bud? You lay down, lay down. Okay, the sweater of the day today is called the Garden Dream Sweater and, or the Tulip Sweater if you're knitting it for children. Carrie Hammett wrote this sweater and Carrie was the former owner of my local yarn store. And she did two books um, and, and wrote some patterns as many yarn store owners do. Um, and it's a worsted weight sweater and she was teaching a class and a friend of mine said will you take that garden dream sweater class with me um, they're selling kits at the yarn store of dreaming color classy and i thought oh i don't necessarily need to take the class but I, I could do it to be with you and the reason that they made kits in the dreaming color classy is because you need so many colors in this yarn that this the Dream and Color Classy stripe pattern would be cost prohibitive because you would have to buy one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine skeins of yarn, and then you needed more than one skein of some of them. So that, you know, that in itself makes at least a, you know, 200 and some dollar sweater, and that's just not going to work. So what they did is they wound off the amount of, of yardage you needed for your size and put them together in kits. So they picked like, I think there were four colorways to choose from, maybe even fewer than that. But you could then go in, they would wind off the yarn of all the skeins that they had. Carrie, Carrie must have bought hundreds of skeins of yarn to, ha to have this happen. But then at the last minute, my friend <clears throat> dropped out of the class. So I dropped out of the class too. And then a couple of months later, I got a call from the yarn store that they still had this yarn on hold for me. And it had already been wound. And I said, but we didn't take the class. And they said, well, we wound the yarn. So I was like, all right. So I go in and buy the yarn because they had wound it. And I'm gonna knit the sweater. And then there was a color, I think this one, that I just didn't like at all. It just really made this whole color palette not tolerable for me so I bought a different skein of one of these I can't I, in a, I think it was the pink but I'm not sure it might have been the maroon something to to pop it up a little bit so I love the sweater now this is a simple striped cardigan with a little um knit one slip one knit one slip one when you change your color on it here, let me show you it as a child sweater. This is a little child sweater that I made called the tulip sweater for a little boy. I made them for my nieces and nephews. And the more yarn I bought of the Dream and Color, the more yarn I had, you know, s leftovers to make other ones. So here is one. My mom had the prettiest one, I think. That's the one I knit for my mother. 
And can I just say, you guys, my mom fell a week ago, two um, weeks ago, two, I guess, two Fridays ago. Um, it hasn't been two weeks, but she fell off the back step. Um, it was slippery. Um, if they have quite a big step into their backyard, my dad was in his wood shop in the back and she went out to, to see him and he had said to her, some birds built a nest in the pot by the back door. So when you come out the back door, be careful because they might flutter. And she remembered when she opened the back door that the birds might be there. So she turned quickly to kind of look at them and lost her footing on the slippery step and fell. She did not hurt her back. You know, she had that major back surgery in November. So she's been recovering, but she hurt her shoulder and she has to have her shoulder replaced. It's just really a bummer. She just has not been able to catch a break. I think this is her 25th surgery because she has this degenerative, degenerative fascia. So when they took the MRI, she has no soft connective tissue in the shoulder. And he said, you know, she tore the rotator cuff and something else. And he said, we're just gonna have to replace it, Marge. She's had all of her other body parts practically replaced. So when I called her after the MRI, because they sent her home for the long weekend um, with pain pills and a sling uh, before she got out of the MRI. When I called her, I said, how are you doing? She said, oh, you know, she's, we're doing okay. Your dad's helping take care of me. We're, we're doing, you know, we're hanging in there. And then I said, mom, are you sleeping? And she said, well, and I could hear her voice kind of crack. And my heart just kind of broke. And I had her on speakerphone and Kylie was listening and I hung up and I said, I gotta go see my mom. I, I feel so bad, you know, I don't live in town. My brothers and my sister-in-law live there, but, and I was looking at my schedule and I taught a Ravelry class on Monday and I taught a class on Thursday and Kylie started her new job on Friday and Ross was out of town from Tuesday to Thursday, Monday to Thursday. I mean, it was just kind of a crazy week last week. And, and so we both looked at each other and I said, if I left early Wednesday morning, I could drive the four some hours to South Dakota, Sioux Falls, where I'm from, see my mom for the afternoon and then drive home. And Kylie said, I, I will go with you. Uh, she had tons to do, but she's like, I'll go. We'll, we'll, we'll do it in one day and we can share driving and we'll go see grandma. So we did. And boy, it really meant a lot to her. Um, because I said my mom about this sweater, I thought, I'll just tell you guys, maybe you could Keep her in your prayers. Yeah. We'll go through this sweater here a little bit. So we talked briefly about Amy Herzog saying that the naked eye does not um, think that horizontal stripes make you look wider. And when I wear this, I don't feel like it necessarily makes me look wider. But the thing I like about a cardigan is that it provides a long horizontal stripe up your front. So it can elongate you in that way which is one of the things that I really like about this sweater is that it's got this gold band that is offset, so it doesn't match it, but it's, you know, a nice horizontal long line up the front of your body. Um, and so for one, one nice thing, if you're short or um, wide, and you want a, something to help elongate you, one of the things you can do, you know, that whole monochromatic, um, dressing in one color can help you look longer and leaner um, but also um, a heel can help you look longer and lean, leaner and a cardigan can help you look longer and leaner so that is a nice um, this is a top down raglan you've got raglan shaping and it's a uh, knit front back so it's a little decorative right there I don't know if you guys yeah you should be able to see that right there um, and then it's seed stitch on the collar cuffs and the bottom my buttons are little diamond, are little square buttons. They're maroon in color. They kind of match this maroon. And then I turn them on the diagonal a little, to, or straight up and down to make them, to sew them on in a way that made them not square. So they're shaped like a diamond when they're on the, on the button band there. So here's probably one of the biggest tips that I teach in my, um, in my sweater classes. And it is that when you are knitting a cardigan like this, that you probably won't wear open as much as you wear closed. Uh, one of the things that you can do to get a really nice button band is to stitch the button band shut. You take a running stitch and matching yarn and you just stitch along the one side and then down around the bottom 
and up the other side. Because we've all seen, this one can unbutton here because I did always stitched it up to here. Um, so I can faux, leave it open. Um, we've all seen cardigan sweaters that go button, gap, button, gap, button, gap, like that, right? Because the, the button bands don't line up. If you stitch that down like this, you don't get that. Another really nice thing about having that long vertical line and wanting that there and saying, I'm never gonna wear this cardigan open is that then you don't have to put buttonholes on the button band because you can just sew the buttons on top of the button band and skip the buttonholes altogether. <laughs> I know, it's a big, huge cheat. But I have a few sweaters that I just know that I'm not going to wear flapping in the wind. I don't, I don't like to, I like a more buttoned up look. I like that long vertical line. And so on this one, I do have buttonholes because I, I did that after the fact. So I can open it to here, but I'm gonna reach in here and show you another trick. So here is my yarn, my gold yarn that I stitched this shut with, okay? And let's say I'm going to a shindig and I'm inside and it gets incredibly warm or I'm a woman of a certain age and I suddenly get incredibly warm. This can also be used as a basted rip cord. So I could excuse myself for a moment and rip this basting stitch right out of that and unbutton those buttons very quickly and have it turn into a cardigan again if I needed it to. Um, because some of you will totally understand that in that moment you're so hot that you can't take this cardigan off because the shirt underneath it is sweaty and you might have, you know, sweat marks or water rivulets running down your body. And so you do not have to make this permanent if you don't want to. You can just tuck that in right in there. So we're gonna go back now in time and think a little bit about previous sweaters that you've seen on this podcast. This being one, most recent, my February lady sweater is sewn shut. See how nice those just line up right there? It never gaps, it never pulls, and it's kind of that high-waisted or ampere waist or baby doll construction, I'm never going to wear this shut on the top or open on the top, open. I'm never going to let that those giant buttons flap open because that's the decorative part of the sweater, right? It's always going to be closed. So I don't have to make the buttonhole. I can just overlap it, stitch it down, stitch the three buttons on the outside. I mean, if one, if one of the things that you hate doing is making buttonholes on button bands and making those things line up. You could take that out of your wheelhouse if you didn't want to do it anymore. So <laughs> I have a number of sweaters that we will be seeing going forward and a couple of previous sweaters um, that are cardigans that I have temporarily or permanently stitched shut and this is one of them. The, another reason that these buttons stay in the diamond shape so well is because that button band is shut. The buttons don't move. I don't unbutton them and button them all the time. So I don't get really uh, loosey goosey buttons that button holes that don't keep buttons shut. I, I can just, these I did put through, I stitched through the buttonhole to the back when I, um, because I did put buttonholes on this and I can, I can button it all the way up to the top or just part so, way up. There you go. There's your giant tip for the day. I know a lot of you have been reaching out and commenting to me that you learn something new in every podcast, but this one's a secret, okay? We're not telling other people. This is between you and me. So this is a special part of my class that I only tell to special people who want to have perfectly formed button bands with long vertical lines and a rip cord. <laughs> Let's finish today with a Corey story. I already told you most of the story 
in the section when we talked about sweaters today, about my mom's fall and our quick trip to South Dakota. Uh, but we went down for the day. Kylie and I went to lunch with my parents. We had tacos, my favorite food. And uh, then we went back to the house and we visited for a while. And then mom wanted to take us out to a new boutique in town that she, um, she wanted to try on a jacket. And she also wanted to go to the department store to try on some pants. And she needed help with that because of her shoulder. And uh, so we said, you know, we'd be happy to do that. And then uh, we helped her and she got those things taken care of. And then we decided to um, go out to dinner with my sister-in-law and my niece, uh, who's Kylie's cousin and my parents. Nice. We left about 7.30 that night to head home and we had to stop in Worthington, which is an hour into Minnesota, back um, to clean the windshield of the car because we have had so much rain in Minnesota from the rivers, the streams, there's standing water everywhere in the fields, in the ditches. We just, everything's flooded. And the bugs were unbelievable. I have never experienced something like this in my life. It was as if it were raining. It just sounded like that on the windshield the entire time and then occasionally a bigger one and Kylie said mom I can't I can't I don't dare turn on the windshield wipers because it will just smear it all so we had to stop at a gas station clean off the windshield then we got to Wyndham we had to do the same thing and then we got to Mankato and we had to do the same thing I'm going to show you guys a picture of what my front of my car looked like if you're squeamish just look away for a couple of seconds but I don't think you will believe it unless I show you what it was like. It was incredible, disgusting, but I have never seen any, have, have you guys seen something like that before? I mean, we, you know, you can drive a four hour trip and get home and have a buggy windshield. But this was like, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And we, we had to keep stopping and scrubbing it off. And, and I ran it through the car wash and it didn't come off. Then I had to scrub it. It was just crazy. So I thought, wow, I wonder if that's happening in other places and it just had never happened to me before. Like um, places that have flooded, uh, you know, if the bugs just get so bad because they've had so much rain. I mean, we've had rainy seasons before, rainy years, but this just seems to be above and beyond. I, I just found it extraordinarily wild. And so we got home about midnight that night and then um, Kylie started her new job today. So we'll see how that goes um, for her. We found an apartment in St. Paul for her this weekend. So uh, that was fun. We went over and looked at three different apartments. And I think that's all I have for you guys today. I, I really rambled on and on. So I'm hoping that I didn't forget anything. And until next time, Keep it colorful and waddle on.